going to call the October 24th meeting of the Hay City Commission to order. Next item on the agenda are the minutes. Consider approval of the minutes from the regular meeting held on October 10th, 2019. Are there any changes? I have none. None. Hearing none, they're approved as presented. My favorite thing all year long, presentation of service awards to City of Hayes employees. I'm going to present service awards to City employees for 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25 years of service. Okay, good evening, commissioners. We're proud to present to you the following employees for service awards. First up are the five-year awards, Dave Gillen. Dave started his career with the city as a police officer. Two years later, Dave was promoted to police corporal, Dave Gillen. Next up. <laughs> Next up for five years, Jason Regal. Jason first joined the city as the water conservation specialist. In 2017, he was promoted to his current position of water reclamation and reuse superintendent. Jason Regal. Next for five years, Jason Dinkle. Jason rejoined the city as a dispatcher in 2014. He was later promoted to lead dispatcher. Jason Dinkle. Next five year service award, Kevin Camphouse. Kevin has served his five years with the city as a superintendent for the golf course. Kevin Camphouse. Next five years, Matt Schmidt. Matt is currently a part-time maintenance worker for Water Resources. Matt Schmidt. Next five years, Stefan Gildemeister. Stefan began his employment as a Hayes police officer. In 2019, he was promoted to a master police officer. Stefan Gildemeister. Next five years, Tanner Paps. Tanner started as a volunteer firefighter and became a full-time firefighter two years later. Tanner Paps. Next up are the 10-year service awards. First up, Chris Hancock. Chris began his career as a part-time police officer with the city. One month later, he was promoted to a full-time police officer. In 2014, he was once again promoted to police corporal and took his newest title as police sergeant in 2016. Chris Hancock. Next 10 years, Chris Rohrabaugh. Chris has served the city the last 10 years as a part-time code enforcer. Chris Rohrabaugh. <laughs> Next 10 year award is Clayton Unruh. Clayton has worked his 10 years at the Chichola Creek Water Reclamation and Reuse Facility. He started as a plant operator and moved up to his current role, senior plant operator. Clayton Unruh. <laughs> Next 10 year award, Dustin Anderson. Dustin started his career as a maintenance worker one for the service division. Dustin continues to work for the service division and is currently a senior maintenance worker. Dustin Anderson. Next 10 year, Kelly Sprague. Kelly joined the city as a dispatcher. Two years later, she became a records clerk with the Hayes Police Department. 
Kelly Sprague. <laughs> also for 10 years, Colleen Domi. Colleen began employment with the city as a records clerk for the Hayes Police Department. In 2019, she took on a new role as the municipal court clerk. Colleen Domi. Next 10 years, Mike Winholtz. Mike was hired by the city as a maintenance worker one for the parks department. He was promoted to maintenance worker two in 2011 and then to park technician in 2014. Mike Winholtz. Next 10 years, Tom Mai. Tom has served the city as an information technology technician for the last 10 years. Tom Mai. <laughs> Next up for 15 years, fifth, first one for 15 years is Brandon Zimmerman. Brandon began as a volunteer firefighter for the Hayes Fire Department. A year later, he moved to a full-time firefighter position, and in 2019, he was promoted to senior firefighter, Brandon Zimmerman. Next 15 year award, Justin Coitz. Currently a senior firefighter, Justin started with the Hayes Fire Department as a volunteer firefighter. In 2005, he joined the department full time as a firefighter. Justin Coitz. <laughs> Next one for 15 years, Linda Bixman. Linda has served the Planning, Inspection, and Enforcement Division for the last 15 years as their administrative assistant. Linda Bixenman. 15 years goes to Luke Scobie. Luke was hired by the city as a volunteer firefighter. He became a full-time firefighter in 2005. In 2011, Luke was promoted to his current role of fire lieutenant. Luke Scobie. Another 15 year, Myron Dryling. Myron began his career within the city in 2004 as a firefighter and in 2019, he was promoted to senior firefighter. Myron Dryling. Final 15 year goes to Ryan Hagens. Over the course of Ryan's 15 years with the Hayes Fire Department, he has served as fire lieutenant, fire captain, deputy fire chief, and his current position as fire chief. Ryan Hagens. Now for the 20 year awards, Mark Lang. Mark was hired by the city as a plant trainee for the wastewater division in 1999. During his tenure, he was promoted to plant operator one in 2000 and senior plant operator a year later, Mark Lang. <laughs> <laughs> Next for the 20 year awards, Aaron Larson. Aaron joined the Hayes Police Department as a dispatcher. A year later, he was promoted to a police officer and has held multiple roles, roles as a law enforcement officer for the city of Hayes, including uniform investigator, detective, and his current role, detective sergeant, Aaron Larson. Next 20 years is Tessa Sheck. Tessa started with the city as an office clerk for the Water Resources Department. She, she currently serves as that department's administrative assistant, Tessa Sheck. Next 20 year award, Steve Schmidtberger. Steve was employed by the city 20 years ago as a plant trainee in the water plant. Shortly after, he was promoted to plant operator one, and two years later was promoted to his current position, senior plant operator, Steve Schmidtberger. And our final service award for 25 years tonight, Steve Dryling. Steve began his career as a refuse collector in 1994. He has also served as a maintenance worker one for the service division, a truck driver for the solid waste division, and a refuse equipment driver, which has reclassified to his current position, <coughs> solid waste senior maintenance worker, Steve Dryling. Let's give everybody a round of applause. All the employees come forward, please. Thank you. Thank you.
Enjoy the evening. <laughs> Next item is a financial statement. Consider approving the financial statement for the month of September 2019. Thank you. This is financial summaries for the City of Hayes, month end of September 30, 2019. Revenues in September totaled 2,832,142. That was a decrease of 185,650 compared to the same period as last year. One notable area of revenue increase is interest income across all major funds, up 165,500 over this time last year. Keeping in mind, these are CDs maturing from terms that were a little over a year in maturity. However, given recent interest rate adjustments by the Fed, we have been experiencing a drop in rates as CDs mature and renew. Issue dates this month with maturities of just over a year have experienced a 50 to 80 basis point drop. Notable area of revenue decrease. Solid waste reserves revenue fell 89,000 due to the settlement received on a refuse truck claim this time last year. And month to date water consumption for September was down when compared to a year ago. Total residential and commercial water consumption was down 23%, translating into a total water revenue decrease of 31,000, with conservation down 27,000. Year-to-date, total water consumption is still down 6%. Total revenue, however, is up 1%. Expenditures in September totaled 2881925 That's a decrease of 20538 compared to 2018. Notable areas of increased expenditures. Parks Improvement Fund expenditures were up 9000 due to storm damage repair. And you'll see the credit over the next few months as insurance covers these expenses. Special parks and recreation projects were up 29,800 due to the new Rolling Hills sidewalk going in. Water reclamation reserves was up 21,700 when compared to last year as a result of a change order to repair the settling sewer line on the Elm, Forth, and Ash projects. Uh, notable areas of decreased expenditure, other contractual and airport improvement fell 13,700 as a result of new airport parking completed this time last year. And stormwater debt services were off 250000 when compared to this time last year as we completed the debt payment back in May of 2019 to save interest costs since idle cash in the fund was available. Month to date, general fund sales tax collections were at 670958 That's an increase of 41500 or 6.59% as compared to last year. Year-to-date general fund sales tax collections are at $5,488,005, up 118420 or 2.2%. The six-month average is at 1.13, which is a decrease of 0.87 when compared to a year ago. Report of top 10 quarter-to-date sales tax collections by classification is up 65,366, or 3.3%, 3 .3 compared to the same time last year. These top
top 10 now represent 75% of the total sales tax collections for September. And finally, the portfolio certificates of deposit on September 30, 2019 totaled $60.3 million with a weighted average interest rate of 2.35, that's up 0.4 from a year ago. Total balance of the money market account on September 30 was $2 million, with the current yield of 0 0.9. And total investments are up $3.143 million when compared to this time last year. I make a motion that we accept the September 2019 uh, financial statement. Second. Any discussion? On that uh, first item, uh, the uh, drop in revenues, $185,000, did you uh, explain, did I miss that, What you th why that was like that? Excuse me, the $185,000? Or hundred six. Uh, let's see. Um, it was one of the first things you, oh, yeah, it was in the, uh, right after the, um, kind of in the third line there, revenues in September totaled $2.8 million, a decrease of $185,000. So that, that's a Compared to the same time last year. That's a culmination. <coughs> That's a culmination of all revenues, so it's several things all at once. And over the years, what I've tried to do is report on items that, you know, are, are of significance. So when you look at all revenues all across all funds, we had a we had a, a, a decrease. And then I try to highlight below some of the some of the comparisons: the increased revenue, decreased revenue. And then on that sales tax, didn't we have a, did we have an increase last month as well? A slight, a lot, slight, yes. Yeah. Good news. What did we project the sales tax to be for the year? You remember what that was? 2020 budget, we were up 2%. 2 percent. Okay. Good to see. Any other questions? Offer the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carries 5 0. Appreciate everyone here in the audience and those watching at home. This is your meeting and this is your part of the meeting. Uh, public comments. If anyone would like to present to the Commission on a non agenda item, don't see anyone, this would be your time. We're going to move on. There's uh, no, nothing on the consent agenda. There's no unfinished <coughs> business. New business, First Care Clinic. Here an update from representatives of First Care Clinic. Thank you for coming tonight. If you would please state your name for the record. Thank you. My name is Brian Brady. I'm the CEO of the First Care Clinic. And uh, thank you for allowing us to come tonight and uh, give a little update. We're a uh, we're proud of what we've done uh, tonight, and then Dr. Christine Fisher is with me tonight, and she's going to uh, talk a little bit about the quality of care we provide and our services down there. I'm going to give um, an overview of kind of where we've come from, what we're most proud of, and, and what we think we bring to Hayes. So, um, Our mission is to be the region's premier medical home dedicated to providing access to compassionate quality care for all. So. We want to take everybody. We don't care whether you make a dollar a year or a million dollars a year. We're going to provide you the same uh, health care if you walk in our door. So a little bit about us basically is we provide medical, dental, and behavioral health all under one roof. Um, that's not very common. Most of the time those services are segregated out. We think we can do a really good job by providing them all um, at one location. So patients don't know whether the person sitting beside them there is to see the doctor, the dentist, or the uh, therapist for behavioral health. So they're, you know, they're, we, we try to eliminate that stigma that, sometime come, that sometimes comes with mental health services. Um, some things we're not, we're not a walk-in clinic. Um, we we kind of get labeled that sometimes, and it's very frustrating for our staff and frustrating for patients when they walk in off the, off the street and they're like, I want to be seen, do you have an appointment? No, I was told you're the walk-in clinic. Where, where did you hear that? No, I talked to my friend. Well, you know, we've got a full schedule of appointments. We'll, we'll try to work you in, but you know, it, there's no guarantees. And so that, that's really frustrating. So we, we try to discourage that. We're not a free clinic. Uh, we did used to be a free clinic, though. Uh, way back uh, when, I was told that if you were a patient of First Care Clinic, you had a blue card. And that card would get you services anywhere at our clinic or the hospital. So we haven't seen those blue cards in a while, which is good. But uh, that was uh, that was not a good thing as we want to as we want to go forward because we want to create accountability in people's health care. Um, if, if things are done for free, then I don't have to take care of myself because when I show up somewhere, you're just going to take care of me and fix me, as opposed to, you know, hey, I've got some stake in the game and you know it's going to cost me a little something when I go to the doctor, but it's not a lot. But you know, I can go and I can be taken care of. So we think that's a, that's a really good thing. 
Um, we're also recognized as a patient-centered medical home. So what that means is we do and provide patient-centered care. The patient is at the center of everything we do. Now, I know that sounds like that uh, should be uh, a no-brainer, right? I mean, we should have the patient at, at the center of everything. But as Dr. Fisher will talk about, you know, we kind of got away from that as, as, as healthcare and, and maybe got, um, call it provider-centric and, and, and clinic-centric. Of, of We did things that were easy for us and maybe weren't always the best for our patients. So um, we've shifted our, our direction in that. Um, we provide integrated care. What that means is that we have all the services together, not only under one roof, but all those people talk to each other. In our medical record, we have one record that has your dental, your behavioral health, and your medical record all in one. So if the dentist prescribes you something, your medical provider is going to know about it. Or if you have an allergy to something that's been identified in the medical clinic, your dentist is going to know about it, which we think is, is just fantastic. And I talked about we have care for everyone, so we, we don't care your income. Um, we do ask people for income for their income if they're going to take advantage of our sliding fee scale program. So, and what that is is if you qualify, which is a uh, hundred percent of the poverty and lower, you can get your medical visit for twenty dollars. That's all your labs. That's any tests that we can do in house. Um, we we try to take the the worry of what it's going to cost you go to the doctor out of the equation because. We know if people delay care, they end up in the emergency room. That's more costly on the whole healthcare system. Um, you know, and you might say, "Well, that doesn't that doesn't affect me." Why? You know, yeah, it does because if the hospital has people going to them that can't pay the bill, what do they do? They raise the charges, and so we all pay those charges. So that's a it's definitely a big thing um, for us. And for a dental visit, it's we've got a little more cost, but it's fifty dollars. And then if you're at 101% of the federal poverty level, clear up to 200%, um, it graduates up to, I think, our top fee for dental is 95, and the top fee for medical is 55. So, um, and we can do this through a federal grant that we get. Um, we can't discount things when people are above the 200% of the federal poverty level. Unfortunately, they don't allow us that leverage, but uh, we do try to work with everybody and, and know that you know people are on limited incomes. And then we also think, too, that if, if we can keep, out, keep people out of medical bankruptcy and things like that, you know, that also helps the Hayes economy, too, because then they've got resources to go do other things as well. Um, we've got extended hours. So from Monday and Tuesday, we're open from 5 to 7. So we have a lot of people that work, and they can't take off to go to the doctor uh, like some of us have that luxury of doing. Um, and then we also have Saturday hours, which is which is huge. Some people are, are gone all week at their job, and they need a place to go to the doctor um, during the weekend that fits their schedule. And the last thing I'll say about it is we fill gaps. We're not here to compete with private industry in, in the town or um, you know for the ho at the hospital. We work very closely with Hayes Med. We have a great relationship with them, and frankly, we couldn't do what we do without them. So uh, you know. We have, to, we have to work together, and we want to fill those gaps. And if, if we go somewhere you know, and do something, it, it's probably because we feel there's a need that's uh, not being met by the current system. So, um, Talk to you a little bit about the economic impact. Um, I, most of you know we're in the, the old Eddie Clinic. Okay? We've, we've got 50 people in there. So um, I, I'll show you a little bit about what that – where that's come from, but right now we're five million dollar annual budget. We think we've been a, a good part of the re revitalization of downtown. We've done over two million dollars construction to that building, um, so that's uh, we're pretty proud of that as well. We, we finally got the whole building remodeled. Um, we're using all twenty one thousand square feet of it, and then this is how we we're pretty sure we filled a big need in this community. So. In 2008, which is a year before I got there, they were seeing 1,200 patients, 2,500 visits, had four <coughs> employees. So in 2019, and the, the visits and patients are estimates, but they're, they're going to be pretty close because we've got most of the year behind us here. But we think uh, this year we'll see over 7,000 patients, provide almost 18,000 <coughs> visits, and employ 50 people. 
I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Fisher to ever talk about the quality of care. Hello. I'm Dr. Christine Fisher, and as many of you know, I practiced cardiology in Hayes for a number of years, about 18 years actually, and I love Hayes. And uh, at the, or nearing the end of my interventional career, after about 10,000 procedures, I was getting fried, and I had to get out of the cath lab, which was, I was pretty sure my life was going to end at that point. And uh, I went to a population health conference in Philadelphia, and it was, for me, it was just very life-changing. And it just brought about a much bigger and broader scope of how to better deliver care in your area. And I thought, this is it for me. And so I went to that graduate school and also uh, did a master's in the science of healthcare delivery through Arizona State University, which was a phenomenal school. And they really talked about the nuts and bolts of how to do this. And so I finished a couple of those programs and went and talked to Brian in early 2017 and said, would you be interested in, in innovating and trying uh, th these different models of care? And so, so that's where we started back in early 2017. And at that point, the clinic was a walk-in clinic primarily. And Brian and I realized we needed to deliver comprehensive care, full body care, because walk-in clinics are great for sprained ankles, they're good for sinusitis, uh, you know, smaller, more minor medical problems. But the true value, what we get, the bang we get for our buck, the true value of care is typically measured by those problems that determine the morbidity and mortality of a patient. And those are the problems that potentiate um, coronary disease and strokes and cancers. And so with that, if we have an opportunity to see patients when they walk in or come into our clinic, we have to take a full body approach so that we can address all of their underlying medical problems. They typically won't come in for those other reasons but they will come in for the, the things that are bothering them, but we take the opportunity to say, hey, let's now deal with the things that are gonna kill you. And you know, they, they, they get that. And so uh, with that, it really required a change in the culture of providers. Uh, Walk-in medicine and in and out, uh, the uh, pill and procedure approach is, uh, it's very easy. It's very scripted medicine. Dealing with the behaviors that, that cause many of these underlying medical problems, that's the difficult part. And so with that, we needed to develop a whole new infrastructure that integrated care. So not only did we need to do uh, the, the medical portion better and really hit on wellness and prevention, but we also needed to address the behavioral component. And that has been, uh, well, that's really the, the the million dollar question in, in all of, of healthcare. And so what we did is we added a couple of integrated health specialists. And what they do is we will talk to the patients and talk to them uh, about their, their medical problems. And, and we do not only uh, physical vital signs, but also take behavioral health vital signs. We screen for depression, for example, which is a, which is a huge deal, and it's a huge contributor of comorbidities. And so when we have these patients in, uh, we then take the opportunity to have them meet with our integrative health specialists who can then talk to these patients about the underlying problems that are driving the health behaviors that eventually cause the health outcomes or contribute to the negative health outcomes. And so we have added, great, added those integrative health specialists, and we also have uh, a special licensed counselor that can deal with the deeper issues, for example. And then with that, uh, we realized that there was uh, a huge problem with trying to get people into High Plains Mental Health, for example. It's uh, easily a six to eight week uh, waiting period. And so we started a telehealth service with a, a young lady who actually prescribes over a telemedicine platform and helps us with the behavioral health uh, interventions. And so with that, this is what happened with our quality when we finally integrated all of our care. And so the bars on the far left, uh, the, oh, nice. 
So here, there's the blue is 2018. First quarter of 19 is the orange. First quarter of 2000, or excuse me, the second quarter is green, Kansas average, and the national average. And so the first three bars on the left are our statistics from the last three quarters. And then the two bars on the right are the Kansas averages and the national averages. And so if you look at hypertension, for example, the national average is 63%, and we're hitting 83% in terms of blood pressure control, less than 140 over 90. Uh, A1C control is a measure for diabetes, <coughs> for example. 54% is the national average, and we typically run in the 70 to 75% range. Uh, coronary patients, again, the number one killer in the U.S., uh, we're running up in the 88% versus the national average of 81%. Colorectal cancer, this is actually what Brian hired me for. So I went into Brian and I, I said, you know, I'd really like to try some innovative ideas here. And he says, you know, our cancer, col colorectal cancer screening rate has been between 32 and 35% for the last eight years. You know, what can you do to help us with this? And so we uh, introduced a number of, of uh, different processes in the office, changed the culture, turned it into a culture of quality, and now for colorectal cancer screening, we're sitting at 68%, which is far above the national and state averages. With that clinical depression, uh, again, we screen uh, every patient that we possibly can because, again, the suicide rate for Ellis County, as you know, is above, uh, is above average, and as is the drinking rate. And so with that, all of these behaviors then trigger all these health outcomes. And likewise, cervical cancer, we screen at a uh, high 70% range, and the state and national averages are getting the 50-55% range. Um, childhood immunizations, that's primarily done through Hayes Med, so we don't do a whole lot of that. Uh, but the BMI, that's the body mass index, uh, obesity is a huge problem, of course, and with that, that drives the rate of coronary disease and cancers and strokes. Uh, and so we really try to hit on uh, counseling for those problems, tobacco use uh, similarly, and also asthma. And so I mention all of these things um, because, oops, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> um, because it can be done better and differently. It requires a, a new set of tools and certainly a different way of thinking. It does require a patient-centered approach rather than the traditional provider-centric uh, approach. And uh, our team consists of myself and four nurse practitioners. Uh, one of the nurse practitioners has been there for about five or six years, and the other three have uh, nearly 20 years of experience each in terms of hospital-based care, cardiovascular care, et cetera. And uh, the nurse practitioners have equivalent outcomes in terms of ambulatory patients. Um, uh, so with that, uh, we have a very strong model in our clinic for de the delivery of primary care. Uh, okay. Do you have any questions for Mr. Brady or Dr. Fisher? I have one. Um, do you take patients that do have insurance, and do you take Medicare? Yes. Uh, right, right now, our... Uh, our payment model is about 30% Blue Cross Blue Shield, about 30% Medicare Medicaid, and about 30% are uninsured. So what we tell everybody is we take everyone. Great. I was there for your ribbon cutting, and I was blown away because you just see the little building from the street. Mm -hmm. And once you go in there, uh, it, it is phenomenal. It's uh, second to none after your renovations mm -hmm. I was uh, everybody that was there was just totally blown away when well, and we didn't want I mean it's a basic human right to have good quality care everyone should have access to care and that is our goal and again it should be regardless of, of income and so uh, we have plenty of uh, our old heart patients for example uh, coming over and they love that patient-centered high quality care and with that we had wonderful uh, benefactors for the building, actually, Dane Hansen and uh, the Bob Schmidt Foundation and Drowling um, uh, and Mr. Beaker. So th they were able to really help us finance that, and they did a beautiful job. That is really nice. So 
really appreciate you coming and giving me the update. I, I've learned a lot just sitting here for this short time this evening. I appreciate it, and congratulations for all you've done, and thank you for what you're providing for our community. Thank you. That um, uh, point you brought out about that being huge, uh, having those extended hours, and also on, on Saturdays, um, that has got to be a tremendous uh, service here in Hayes for all those folks that, you know, can't get off work or working out of town, get in on Saturdays. So kudos to you for doing that. That's great. I mean, access to care is, is a huge issue. And if you don't uh, give affordable care, high-quality care, or accessible care, you know, people will, will let their medical problems go, and then you end up with a very expensive or advanced problem. And so we think we ho it hopefully not only benefits the patient, but then all of us as the contributors to the, the cost equation. Amen. Dr. Fisher, that's great. Thank you for taking time out of your Thursday night to talk to us. I know there was some question as to why I wanted them on the agenda. Back in January, I heard from an employee, and then I've heard from many patients, that something incredible, something extraordinary is happening here. And I thought, well, we need to hear about it. Thank you very much for your work. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 2020, on that topic, 2020 health insurance for City of Hayes employees. Good evening, Commissioners. Aaron Giebler, Director of HR. So let's start off with a little background on our current health insurance plan. In 2017, the city switched to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas, and began offering a triple option plan. Those options were the high deductible health plan, the premium plan, and the base plan. Since switching to the triple option plan with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas, we saw a decrease in both 2018 and 2019. And because of the good renewals, we have been able to keep employees' costs the same over those three years. The high deductible plan has consistently been the most popular plan, plan with about 58% of our employees electing that plan. The other two plans have about 21% of employees electing those options. The city of Hayes received Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas renewal rates for 2020, and I'm happy to state due to the city's low utilization, uh, the renewal presented to the city of Hayes showed another decrease, a 2% decrease based on the city's expected enrollment. The city's 2020 estimated cost after the employee premium contributions would be $1,683,700. Staff recommends continuing the 2019 benefits for 2020 as is, including keeping the same employee premium costs. City staff is also recommending up to $120,000 to continue the city's health savings account contribution match of $1,000. The total cost of premiums and health savings account contributions being recommended is $1,803,700. This recommendation comes in below the amount budgeted for health insurance in 2020. This is the action that staff is requesting, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. I move we authorize the city manager to sign an agreement with Blue Cross Blue Shield to provide employees with a triple option health insurance plan with the city's estimated cost being one million six hundred eighty three thousand seven hundred and authorize up to one hundred and twenty thousand to fund employees health savings accounts both out of the employee be benefit levy fund second any discussion or questions good job, Amy. Yeah, great job. It's really the employees I right. mean it's yeah. their utilization it's their um, they drove the high deductible plan they're the ones who wanted it back the health savings account is a huge uh, perk for people to choose it um, and with our new employees, our biggest cheerleaders of getting them on the high deductible plan is talking to other employees that they work with, and they go, what? You chose what plan? You need to go back and, yeah. and choose this one. So That's good. Um, it's really the employees who are driving the utilization. That's great news. Thank you. How much, so for every 1000 we put in is a dollar for dollar? What is the employee match? How does that look? Yes, it's a dollar for dollar. So What's they have some stake into it um, as well. So they put if they get the city's full 1000 they put a 1000 they have 2000 right there. How much? maximum per employee can one put in? Can one put in 2,000, the city matches 1,000? Yes, yes. So there's, um, the federal law sets caps on how much you right. can put in your health savings account. The city can put in 1,000 and you can continue on after that, and many of our employees do. What happens to the funds, say, I don't use my, my savings account for 2019, does it roll over or is it exhausted? It's, it's gone. 
the best part about the health savings account. It does roll over year to year, and if you ever got off a high deductible health plan, you can continue to keep those funds and use it for medical purposes. Uh, you just can't put money into it anymore. Okay. Any other questions or discussion? All for the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. I think we're done for the night, Kirby. Oh, uh, there's one more. Mr. Uh, Crippen. Uh, Mr. Crippen is going to talk about the I-70 water crossing and booster station award of bid. Good evening, Commissioners. Jeff Crispin, Director of Water Resources. <laughs> the capital improvement plan within the 2019 budget includes a project to construct a new booster pump station and an additional water line under I-70 to provide a redundant crossing of water or redundant supply of water to the north of interstate. The redundant line is what we typically refer to as a looped line. This is a photo of the area where the current booster station is located and the line. The booster station is actually located right there on 41st Street. Try that again. And um, water is fed north of I-70 by one 16-inch water main that crosses under I-70 and it needs to have some, uh, some redundancy. In 1993, this line and the half million gallon tower, which is on the visual up there, were constructed to supply water to just a few businesses back then. Uh, this area north of I-70 is what we refer to as the north pressure zone, area south of I-70 obviously, or the south pressure zone currently. In the last 26 years, we have seen growth in this area of many businesses that are vital to the economy of the area and the daily needs of our residents, surrounding communities, and travelers along I-70 or US 183. A failure of this single, single line under I-70 would have huge consequences for us to be able to provide water for use as well as fire protection to everything north of I-70. The economic, economic impact of, the, of being without water service north of I-70 for any length of time would be significant uh, to, city or the, to the operations of those businesses. Typical water main breaks, as I mentioned last week, we, uh, w once we get notification of a water main break, it usually takes us about four hours from the time we we're notified to restoring service to that area so we do that pretty quick but as I have mentioned before and as you may imagine we cannot go through and start digging up I-70 um, approval to bore a new line using federal or state officials and the work itself would take us probably weeks in order to to get that rolling again so that is very important Back in uh, 2018, we had a study that recommended connecting a new 12-inch water main um, at 45th and Hall, which is right there, and going north of I-70 and then over to Carrico impl Implement here um, at 48th Street. There is a dead-end line there, and it would be a new 12-inch line, and that would be connecting to 12-inch lines um, at both locations. Uh, this project also calls for the installation of a new booster pump station on city-owned property, property west of 40, on West 41st Street, just east of Post Road next to City Water Well, number C32, and that is located right there in that, that area. You may remember that the city, purchased, uh, the city purchased the four acres of land in this area in the northwest corner of this property uh, some time ago. The booster pump station will serve as a backup to the existing booster pump station and it will create the ability for us to provide um, a higher water pressure to the areas northwest uh, and northwest areas of Hayes. North of 41st Street basically is where the lower pressures may be. Uh, the new booster pump station will also have room to expand as we grow and as I mentioned last week it will be, power, it, it will be powered by electricity electricity goes out there will be a standby generator that it will be installed as part of that booster pump station um, right now with our current booster pump station we have to actually bring a generator on site if it does go down so that would be powered by gas um, if in case the electricity does go out the yellow lines on this visual uh, show the newly created north pressure zone um, once this project would be completed typical pressures um, in the north um, areas north of 41st Street right now are probably 10 to 15 PSI less than areas to the south. Um, obviously, this varies due to elevations, but the further south of town you get, um, the higher the pressures tend to be um, right now. On March the 7th, a uh, commission gave the city manager and the project manager notice to proceed um, with hiring of Caw, Caw Valley engineers. They're out of Junction City to perform the design and engineering part of this project. Um, on the 24th of September, 
Um, we open bids from the four bidders that are listed on the screen. City staff and Caw Valley engineers reviewed the proposals and the proposal from Midlands Contracting and both recommended accepting the low bid uh, from Midlands Contracting out of Kearney, Nebraska. And I will remind you that in 2011, our sewer lift station out at the sports complex was installed and that work was performed by Midlands Contracting, so we have some experience with that company. Construction would begin if you do approve it tonight as soon as Midlands could mobilize and the contract would call for the uh, work to be complete by July 1st of 2020. And of course, weather would be, um, could be a factor in there. Uh, for the financial part of this entire project, uh, $59,860 was approved by commission in March and that was for the design. Inspection would be completed in house with our Office of Project Management, along with the assistance of Caw Valley and that uh, amount of $14,700 is listed there. That would be within uh, the spending authority of the city manager. Overall, the project cost comes out at $844,238, and that is below our 2019 CIP estimate of $950,000. So tonight, you have three options. One, accept the low bid from Midlands Contracting, direct us to another option, or do nothing. And this is the action I would request, and I would stand for any questions. I have one question. Question. Uh, I noticed that this is a 12-inch line compared to a 16-inch line on the other one. Uh, why did you decide to go with the 12 rather than another 16? Well, reason being is that we already have 12s that are located there, and just extending that, just creating that loop itself will supply us plenty of water um, in that area, but uh, just because of the capacity and the current sizes of the lines that are there. Um, and that was part of the study that was done and the recommendation was made to extend that 12 inch line. But once we create that loop, we have a continuous supply of water that will be running um, through that area, through both lines and booster stations. Okay. And that'll provide adequate pressure. Even if the 16 inch line goes down? Yes, the booster pump station is, is, will perform and be able to supply that amount of water and both booster pump stations will work in tandem with each other. Okay. Make a motion to authorize the city manager to enter a contract with Midlands Contracting Inc. in the amount of $769,678 for the construction of the I-70 waterline crossing and booster pump station project to be funded from water capital. Second. Any other discussion or questions? I do have a question. On the um, booster station, what is the area of uh, booster station? Well, man, I, I don't have the exact dimensions, but it is right now the current booster pump station that we have on 41st Street, mm -hmm. you'll notice is below ground. Um, the new booster pump station will actually, KDHE requires it to be above ground. It won't be a very large building. It'll be actually quite small. Um, I'm trying to think of some dimensions for uh, you, but the, the configuration will be somewhat small for what you would think it would be. I was just curious because potentially future use, what we would do with that land, what we could do on there. Right, and, and, I want, and I do want to point out that, um, and that, that's a great <coughs> question, but let me go to, well, it's going to be kind of hard to see. Down on where this location is, mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Busel, that area that's a little bit lighter in there, that is our actual well location, right. and if you, when you drive by there, it's fenced in. Right, right. This booster station actually is going to go inside that fence. Oh. So we took... Uh, extra precaution to make sure that we're not locating the booster station up towards 41st Street. It'll actually be off of 41st Street back within that area next to that well. So the the most part, the biggest part of that four acres will actually still be usable. Sure. So when we develop that potentially down the road as a fire station, right. we still have the full footprint of use. That was kind yes. of why, where I was getting with that. Okay. My other question on that is, I know we own the land, but how are we assured that that's the right place for the booster pump station? It was it was designed and studied that's by right. our engineers, uh, Caw Valley. That was that recommendation was made basically also because of the type of water lines that are in that area that run along 41st Street. There's also a fairly large line that runs north and south here down this what I would call the alley area behind Post Road, and within that configuration, that's the best area with those lines to be able to provide. Um, the adequate pressures and the water necessary. And this provides enough pressure to get water north of the interstate into the proposed development right. there. That's great. Pressure and, and, and 
get the volume up there is always been a barrier. When I like we're doing this for not only now but for the future. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? Call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5 0. <laughs> Annexation of property located at 700 West 48th Street. Good evening. Jesse Rohr, Director of Public Works. So this evening I want to visit with you about a proposed annexation of property located at 700 West 48th. Property is located and fronts along West 48th Street and does lie between I-70 and 48th to the west side of Vine. Here's a little closer view of the property. Many of you will know this as the former Mid-Kansas Auto Auction property. It's no longer in business currently. This image here, I want you to uh, pay close attention to the yellow line. That actually indicates current city limits. So everything in this area here to the east of the blue property to the right is currently in city limits. So this is a contiguous annexation um, of the, the property that's being proposed. A few things to mention. Property um, does not currently have city utilities uh, servicing the property. <coughs> the water line that Jeff Crispin just spoke about going along 48th Street that you just approved will actually serve the property once it's complete. The developer is also uh, constructing sanitary sewer line. It will extend uh, west from its current location near the Hilton Garden Inn that's under construction currently. I mentioned that the, the property is contiguous with city limits, makes, makes this a much simpler annexation request. In addition to water and sewer, as with any annexation, the property will be afforded all city services, um, including fire and police protection. And I do want to mention that the, in addition to the annexation, and you may see this come up again at a future meeting, at our planning commission meeting this past Monday, the property owner did request a rezoning of the property, of a portion of the property from C2, which is general commercial, to agriculture for the, a proposed development on the property. The Planning Commission did set a public hearing for November, uh, for the November Planning Commission meeting, and um, regard, depending on that outcome, would come before the City Commission for further action. Options tonight, either annex the property as requested or not. This would be the action requested should you consider doing so. And I would take any questions. I move we approve the ordinance number 3970 annexing 700 West 48th Street to the city of Hayes. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roar. Yes. Toby Doherty, City Manager. I'm here to present the progress report this evening. Curtis Dynas, our Planning Inspection and Enforcement Superintendent, presented to three groups of students from the gifted program at uh, O'Loughlin. Um, the students were um, uh, building a 3D city in their classroom and they wanted to learn about city planning. Just for the record, I was never part of the gifted program. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's shocking. <laughs> Um, we hired a diving company um, to help us seal the floodgate. Uh, there's a uh, part where there's a little inlet from the levee um, to where the old channel goes through Fort Hay State's campus, and then there's a floodgate through there, and it also allows water to go through the campus. Um, part of our um, permit uh, to maintain the levee, we were required to inspect and seal that, and so we had to hire a diver to go down and, and perform some work for us. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Jesse question. Uh, <laughs> um, Public Works uh, Service Division put in new ADA ramps at 7th and Oak. Um, they're getting pretty good at uh, all types of concrete work, but they're, they're especially good at the reconforming the ADA ramps. Uh, you might uh, recall my last Friday update. We've received our automated refuse trucks. They are being prepped right now with the equipment, radios, laptops, all of that, and they should be put into service um, within the next week. We're very happy with them. 
Uh, firefighters B.J. Hill and Grady Keith have achieved uh, Fire Instructor 1 status. Um, firefighter testing was held on October 19th. Um, we have one firefighter position open, and um, we had um, 14 applicants that attended the process. We're very happy with that, that yeah. turnout. Yeah. Uh, the Parks Department um, recently hosted a, an electric car race. Um, I'm sorry. Um, the Oktoberfest, the electric car race, and the other events are Rocka, Rockalua and Thunder on the Plains car show. So they were very busy down at Frontier Municipal Park over the last couple of weeks. Uh, municipal Tennis Court resurfacing project is complete. Uh, I believe some of you attended the ribbon cutting for the pickleball courts a couple weeks ago and played. And played. Um, it turned out great. We're very happy with, uh, with the product. Uh, Parks has begun work on uh, the Bickle Smith Sports Complex. Um, we're having uh, red dirt and shale hauled in, um, mixed together, and bringing the infields back up to grade. Uh, we did a pretty good chunk of the sports complex last year. I think this is the, the remainder of it. and. Um, so we're getting getting those back up to almost original condition. <coughs> Sunrise Park, uh, the staff at Sunrise Park removed uh, some juniper bushes that uh, had become quite unruly. Um, I had to do a double take when I drove by there the other day because something was wrong. I could actually see the restroom from the street, but um, it'll be nice. They'll plant it back to grass and it'll it'll grow back in. Um, the Hayes Police Department, you may have saw an article in the paper uh, they created an honor guard. Uh, they made their first appearance actually at the uh, homecoming game and homecoming parade. So uh, guys are very proud to be a part of that and um, I think they do a, a wonderful job. Many people in the community were very proud of that too. Very impressive. And the uh, Corporal Evan Crone gave a tour of the law enforcement center to a group of Girl Scouts on October 15th. I'm not sure if he received any cookies or not. Uh, there is some drainage issues that we've been dealing with um, out at the sports complex, or not sports complex, the new um, fire training facility uh, is in the former parking area um, by the uh, ball fields. Um, so stormwater did some, some work out there to, um, I'm sorry, water resources did some work out there to facilitate the stormwater. And then uh, fifth graders from all USD 489 schools um, and several adults um, attended an event um, hosted by Holly Dickman, water conservation specialist, where students learned about the hydrological cycle, water conservation, and all of our programs, all of our conservation programs. Uh, Thunder on the Plains uh, car show was held, and the CVV provided 200 welcome bags to the attendees in that event. Uh, Brandon Cooley, um, he's uh, part of our CVB staff. He actually has his drone license. Um, and um, so he takes a lot of aerial photography for us. A lot of the stuff you've seen from the uh, wastewater facility rebuild was, was Brandon. Um, anyway, he took uh, some aerial photos during the Fort Hay State game. I am told that the game was disrupted by somebody who was illegally flying a drone. That wasn't right. Brandon. Mm -hmm. Uh, work continues on Ash Street um, north, or I'm sorry, south of 27th. Um, this is being done by JCOR, and they are supposed to be complete November 8th. Good. All the way to the site? Wow. What's the way in? Then uh, the Elm 4th and Ash project uh, con is continuing. They're still working on, um, on Ash Street. And um, they are to be completed mid-November. And I did notice when I drove by yesterday, they have it open to traffic, local traffic, from the intersection of Elm and Ash north up to, I believe, 4th Street. They're still working north of that. And then um, Brenda Kitchen hosts our city clerk, hosted the um, uh, city clerks and uh, municipal finance officers uh, region meeting at the press. And lastly, uh, the city held its uh, biannual employee appreciation picnic. And um, I'm sorry, semi-annual employee appreciation picnic. Um, 
And um, this is an event where the department heads get together. Uh, they cook hamburgers and brats. Um, they serve, they bus tables. As you can see, Chad serves drinks. Um, and um, they do that for all the employees. They come out uh, to the golf course on their lunch break and they have lunch and they go back to work. And it's uh, uh, our way of showing appreciation to employees and they appreciate the, the meal. Uh, that's all I have. Any questions from the city manager? I'll have a, maybe a question. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, the drone. Uh, some time ago, I think it was a few years ago, somebody did a uh, kind of a promotional piece for Hayes where they had a drone that mm -hmm went down Main Street and, you know, kind of all over the area. W was that something that was uh, uh, put together by the uh, Convention Visitor Bureau and they no, used that? No, that oh. was Fort Hayes State University. I forget the instructor that was out there. He was somebody who had a history in okay. film. Okay. No, it was done in the Ag Department. He was the first drone operator in Ellis County. Yeah, uh, anyway, that's Paul Brazino, and he, uh, it was part of a, the instructor, and then the instructor's class was looking for a project, and so um, Paul worked with them to put together sort of a promotional piece. Now, CBB used some of that footage in our promotional pieces, but um, that was a Fort Hayes State project. It was awesome. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's kind of, I showed, you know, sent that to a whole bunch of people, and everybody commented on that, that, it just really kind of did like these photographs that were taken a few years ago. Just really kind of showed what a great community this is, you know. And, and um, it was just done. It was done so professionally. Commissioner inquiries or comments, Commissioner Phelps. No, I just wanted to say that about the drone. Other than that, uh, everybody have a good evening. I have nothing this evening. Uh, I have a small request. Uh, Compass Energy is able to calculate the average bill based on a 12-month cycle. We do it on a three-month cycle. Did staff look at the possibility of the pros and cons instead of calculating one's usage over the first three months of the year for long-term residents doing it over a 12-month period of time? What are the pros and cons? Thank you. Executive session, I'm going to ask for an executive session for 20 minutes to include the city commission, city manager, city project manager, and city council discuss potential property acquisition. So moved. Okay. okay. There's a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 5-0. We're going to go to the conference room and then we'll come back here when we have concluded that.